I go and have you open your Bibles to John chapter 11. I'm sure the passage we're going to be looking at today, you're very familiar with it. It has to do with how people deal with adversity. I titled this message, Gaining the Proper Perspective on Adversity. You know, it's interesting how people respond to adversity. We all have adversity. At some time in our life, we're going to go through different trials, different problems. And some people have a tendency of just raising their arms and going around screaming, help, help, I'm, I'm, I'm falling apart. Others would have a very quiet response and, and just internalize all the pressure. And I could go on giving different types of response. When I see my wife, Alisa, going through adversity, she, she has taught me a lot. She's been, she's been uh, ex experiencing for the last 26, 27 years pancreatitis metabolica, which I don't know how to translate it in English. But all the people that went through the, the healing process with the doctors and everything that's gone on for the 20, last 20, 26 years, they've all died. The doctors, when they see, they see her, normally they're all atheists, they would say, you know, I don't believe in miracles, but when I see you, what's, how, the, how you, you know, what's happened to you, I, 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 I'm humbled because I see it truly that the Lord has done a miracle. And they all coincide saying this, this to her, it's your attitude, it's your attitude. Is this a, no, it's not my attitude. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Gaining the proper perspective on adversity. I came across this a very interesting story. We're going to be going to in John chapter 11 in a few moments. But I found it very interesting. What do you hold on to when adversity comes? So this story goes this way. When a devoted believer of the Lord became seriously ill, a number of friends gathered around his bedside to pray for his healing. The last person that prayed spoke of the faithful efforts of this steadfast witness and concluded his prayer with these words, Lord, you know how he loves you. After a moment of silence, the sick believer turned to him and said, I know you mean well, but please don't plead for my recovery on that basis. When Lazarus was ill, Mary and Martha sent for Jesus but they didn't request help for their brother because of his affection for Christ. They said, Lord, him who thou lovest is sick. And he went on to say, it's not my weak and faltering faithfulness to him that gets his attention, but his perfect love for me. That's my constant strength and hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we go through this world, we will suffer all kinds of adversity, all kinds of troubles. Some we, um, we experience because of really bad decisions we've made. Others are just part, part of life, sometimes caused by us, sometimes caused by others. And Lord, sometimes as believers, we tend to wonder, where is the Lord when I need it most? How come he seems so far away? How come he seems silent when I need him to give me comfort? As Job experienced very clearly in the book of Job. Father, tonight we need a biblical truth to help us through adversity. And I pray that the message that we'll be looking into in John chapter 13 with Lazarus falling sick and the way Jesus responds will help us be able to deal with adversity in a much better way. I pray that you will burn this message in my own heart because I know that if I'm not going through adversity today, it, I'm sure I'm going to have it tomorrow. And most of us will probably go through the same thing. And we need to 
know how to, how to gain the proper perspective, how to look at adversity from your point of view, from where you stand, not from where we stand. Because if we look at it from where we stand, we will just see kind of a distant God who doesn't seem to care. And I pray, Lord, that we will have tonight, we'll gain a better perspective of how you work. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will work through me and be able to bring this message in a very simple, but very clear and a very impacting way. So that next time adversity comes our way, we will know where to look first and that we will understand that you are not a distant God that you can understand what we're going through because you came in the form of man Lord to experience the same afflictions that we experience today be with us this afternoon Father and may we be attentive to the message we find here in John chapter 11 in Jesus name we pray Amen Concerning that story I just read to you, the truth that this man knew was this, that we need to have a proper perspective on adversity. The friend, as he said on the, in the story, he says, I know you mean well, but please don't plead for my recovery on that basis because I love Jesus. No, it's the other way around. I'm able to deal with any situation because I know that he loves me. That's our anchor. And frequently we look, you know, at good things that come our way as being indicators of God's goodness. If, you know, if it's a blessing, of course it comes from God, but if it's, you know, if it, if it hurts, then it cannot be from God. It has to come from Satan somewhere else. You know, bad things always come from Satan, don't they? But we have a situation here this afternoon where you see uh, Lazarus falling sick and uh, his sisters call for a very good friend Jesus Christ and the way Jesus responds to this need is interesting he was a very good friend of Martha Mary and Lazarus every time Jesus passed through Bethany the, there was always a stop in their house and then spent quality time with them they were very special friends and surely if, uh, if Mary or Martha or even Lazarus would call Jesus, a very good friend, to come and help him, of course he would come in, he's done it for people who had, he had no relationship before, he has to respond to our situation, they felt. We need to understand several things about, you know, how we interpret good things and bad things. Sometimes it is the things that we consider bad the things that really have a transforming effect in our life you know who would say that cancer is bad i mean good you know if anybody here goes to the doctor tomorrow and they say you know i have an illness you don't know where it is well let me have to do some checks some some uh, tests and see what goes and then they tell you you have cancer my, my friend uh, all of us would say whoa wonderful what a good experience this is going to be no we, we respond in a negative way, why is this happening to me? We have a, a, a time of processing, but I hope that the conclusion that we come to the, uh, at the end is, Lord, I know that you love me and that it's going to be okay because I have that assurance. I know that you are interested in my in my life in 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 in, uh, in me. So several things come to mind. Several questions. What does it mean to have? all our needs supplied is it only the good things the fun things the rich things the healthy things you know that's good but what about when adversity comes into our lives do we say well that's good too do we respond to adversity the same way we respond to when you know those good things happen i normally have a, a date a, a, an appointment with my grandchildren in california they always call me at nine o'clock and they normally spend like two hours talking to grandpa. They all fight to talk to grandpa, and I love that. <laughs> Let me talk to grandpa, come on, come on, come on. Now they get kids have, you know, take turns. I love it because they, I can see that they love me, but they're fighting about it, and that's what I don't like about it. You know, when I, when I get these calls, I'm thrilled. And, I'm, and it, you know, it, it brings this warm feeling inside of me. But when I get a call maybe from 
uh, somebody else, a loved one, that says, you know, I got really some bad news. I wonder what you can say about this. Maybe you can have, you have some encouraging words for me. What, how can I deal with this? I've had calls with, from people who said I, I, they, they diagnosed cancer. I probably known had more than six months of life for that. What do you say to someone that's going through something like that? How do you deal, how do you have the right, you know, the proper perspective on adversity? We have, uh, have a few verses here to start off with before we go to John 11. But one of them is Philippians chapter 419, which, which says, But my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, it says, Pray be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded, notice here, by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice now, verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven uh, genuineness of the faith of a greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined fire, may result, notice now, as we go through trials, but therefore, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you may not have seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You know, when you look at a, a, a I like documentary, especially if, if they're documentaries on animals, how animals behave, deep ocean documentaries, I'm, I just realized I could spend hours watching them. And uh, very, very shortly, very, not, not too long ago, I saw a documentary on, on how they produce precious pearls. And uh, it's interesting how they produce pearls. They get these pearls, they slightly open them and they throw them, they put something that will irritate the pearl, inside the pearl. And the pearl has a way of, uh, 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 of you know, producing, coating this irritating substance with calcium carbonate, what we call nacre, after entering the oyster. And very soon after, just maybe a year or two later, they go to the same pearl. And they, they don't want to kill the pearl, they open it slightly, and they make a little, a little cut inside the pearl. And they, they bring out that same thing they brought, they put in there two years uh, back into a beautiful, beautiful pearl. Your oyster has a way of dealing with adversity, using irritation to bring something beautiful across. In our story today, in John chapter 11, let's read verses 1 through 3, we find something interesting here. Now, a certain man who was sick, we know who that man was, Lazarus, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with anointing and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest. Notice the same principle there. Not his love for you, but the one you love, he is sick. You know, if you have these two ladies who have their brother, a very good friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, he became very sick, and so sick that they knew that if Jesus didn't intervene, intervene uh, Lazarus was going to be in deep trouble. Again, this family was a very special family for Jesus. They were very good friends, and every time Jesus came to the area, to this area, Jesus would obligate, it was an, almost a, 
a must for him to stop by and spend a few hours with his family. Now, what, what are friends for? Friends are for, you know, when you go through a, a difficult time, and friends normally leave whatever they're doing and, and come to aid you, to help you out. Uh, surely Jesus would, would come to do something about his friend being so sick. They had seen Jesus Christ performing miracles before to people who they, he didn't, they didn't even know him. Jesus, would you please help me? They heard about him, but they didn't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And now this family, this, these two sisters are worried about this difficult situation. A brother's about to die, and I think the only one that can really do something about it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you continue reading in verses 4 and 6, it says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but notice now, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, let's back up, boys. We need to run over there. They, my friend Lazarus needs me. Now he said he abode two, about two days still in the same place where he was. Now, his disciples were seeing Jesus every day, but imagine back home in, at Lazarus' house. The next day, Jesus is nowhere to be seen. The following day, Jesus is still, still nowhere to be seen. And Lazarus is getting worse and worse. Where is Jesus when you need him? Isn't it? This doesn't seem logical. You would think that Jesus would drop everything that he's doing to come and heal this situation. So I think there was confusion in the mind of Mary and Lazarus. I'm sorry, and, and, and Martha. Here's Jesus. Instead of coming to heal his friends, he delays his trip. Instead of healing, he waits. How did help it are you when God waits? You know, you, if you read the story of Job, you'll find that God keeps silence all the way into chapter 30. Chapter 1, you, you see the, 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 the devil and coming before the Lord, and the Lord says, have you, you considered my servant Job? And he gives an incredible report about him as the best in the land. There's no one like him. Then he's given permission to uh, shake around uh, uh, Job and everything he has. In the second chapter, you find that Job has come through very well, and God comes again to the, to the devil, and he says, have you considered my servant Job? And he goes from being the, the best in, the, in, the, in that region to the best in the world in chapter 2. Uh, Job had grown through that trial. But then you see from chapter 3 on, nothing but trouble and more trouble and more trouble and more trouble. Hey, we need friends close by, don't we? Well, yeah, I'm going to bring these two, two, two friends and accompany somebody to help him out. And for, I don't know how many chapters, but all they do is make things more difficult. And where is God in a situation like that? What is God doing? He keeps silent. How do you deal with God's silence? We were talking about that the other day. You know, with, with, with Job, he could, he could handle affliction. He could handle losing everything that he ever worked for. But you see in the following chapters that Job started falling apart when he couldn't hear from God. He didn't feel God's presence. Now, because you're not feeling God's presence doesn't mean that God is not there. Because later on from chapter 30 on, you find that Job is kind of falling apart. He's throwing some very heavy questions, very, um, you know, kind of very daring questions at God. And God responds and responds and says, now I have some questions for you, buddy. And he goes on saying, where were you and this? When were you and that? And, go, you know, just, it's a, it's a way of calling his attention, saying, just because you don't feel, then you don't hear my voice, you don't hear my, feel my, uh, my comfort, me comforting you, doesn't mean that I'm not there. That's a lesson for me, because sometimes, uh, if I trust in my feelings, I might think, I might come to the conclusion that God doesn't really care. 
If we continue reading John chapter 11, verse 11 through 14, he goes on saying, These things he said, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of, his, out, of, out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleepeth, if he's you know, just sleeping nicely, he shall do well. How be it, uh, Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he spoke, that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, No, he's dead. Now he wasn't there to know this. But he knew this. No, Lazarus is actually dead. And uh, the following sentence is striking. The Lord next statement reveals that he had a purpose in mind for the whole situation. Notice verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes. Doesn't finish there, but imagine responding that way. When Martha says, you know, you're late. No good now, no, being here. No, he says, I'm glad that this turned out this way. For your sake, there's something you need to learn about me. Of course, you understand that I'm your friend. You understand that there's something special about me. But how many of you understand that I am truly Lord and Master? I am the Messiah. And for Lazarus and Martha and Mary and many who were around there, they needed to understand that Jesus was more than just a good teacher. Remember when Lazarus, when Lazarus uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night in John chapter 3? Oh, good master, oh, good teacher, rabbi. He said, well, you, you do well calling me rabbi because I am. But there was something about Lazarus that he didn't understand. No, we've seen your miracles. We've talked about them, and we know there's something special about you. But did he understand that Jesus was Lord? There was something about Jesus waiting that, that produced a, a better understanding of, by, by Mary, Martha, and Nazareth, and of many others, a better understanding of who Jesus was. Notice now verse 32 through 36, then when Mary was come, where Jesus was and saw him, he fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, notice how he responds, and the Jews also weeping, which came unto her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35, maybe we're gonna, I'm going to make a go, I'm going to challenge you to memorize this verse during the summer. <laughs> Jesus wept. So short, but so profound. Jesus does care. And Jesus does feel our sorrow. Then said Jesus, then said the Jews, behold how he loved them. And just what was it that Jesus was doing here? Revealing himself in a way not known before this took place. Look at verse 25 and 30, 26. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whatsoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You, you, you guys believe this? Do you really understand here? Now, all this is an introduction for the two points that I want to share with you this afternoon. I'm going to share with you how to gain a proper perspective on adversity by two things that we see in this passage. Adversity reminds us that the Lord re relates to, our per uh, to us personally. He relates to you and to me personally. Now, that's a big, that's hard to understand. Before I was saved, if you know, if I ever dared to believe that God exists, I always saw, yeah, He does, but He's so, so, so far away. It was so far away that I could never relate with Him. And even in my atheism, I prayed to God, saying, Lord, if you do exist, please reveal yourself in some way. And for a while, all I got was silence. And then later on, I started getting, seeing some things that the Lord was 
using to bring me to him. But this is the point we see in this passage. Adversity reminds us that the Lord relates to us personally. Can you say that? The Lord relates to me, to you personally. Oh, that means the pastor, but not everybody else, right? I really want to draw this deeply in your heart. He relates to you personally. So when you're at home and you think, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation. There isn't anybody around to help me. And I'm praying and praying and God doesn't seem to care. And all I get is silence. He, he might be re, have a, a really close relationship with so-and-so, this other person, but I'm just too small for him to have any, to show any care for. Him. No, no, no. Adversity reminds us that the Lord relates to us personally. And one, two things that we will see under this one, he relates to our feelings. He knows what we feel. And he relates with it. He understands. As we see in this passage, he cried with them. He mourned with them. He understood what they were going through. And not only does he relate to our feelings, he relates to our needs. We have needs, but sometimes he responds in a very different way than we would expect. And that's what really, you know, kind of puts a spin on us. You know, I, Lord, you're giving me something that I, that I really don't need. Here I have affliction, and what I need is being uh, free from this affliction, but you seem to bring more affliction. You're, you're waiting. You're not... Lord, you're, you're late. I, I mean, I needed that miracle three weeks ago. I needed that miracle. But Lord, you, you are late. You know. And the second thing we will be seeing at first, it reminds us that the Lord has a purpose in mind. Sometimes we think that God's purpose in our lives is to make us happy and richer and more comfortable. If that, those things are there in their place, then, yeah, I, you know, I can see that the Lord is blessing. But sometimes the Lord takes all of that away. And you say, why would he do something like that? Because he has a purpose in mind. And here we will see that his first, uh, first purpose is to glorify himself. To glorify himself. Through us, that is, through us, how we respond will have one or two effects. One, it will bring people away from God or will bring people towards God. So his first purpose is to glorify himself. The second purpose is to bring others to himself. The way we respond will have made others want to know what is keeping us so whole, so, so um, steady. They will see truly how strong our faith is in Christ. And the third purpose is to get believers focused, focused on Him. When we kind of lose everything, you don't, you don't have any other choice but to go to Him. You know, it's interesting as I was preparing this, I thought, when has God been more glorified in history? When times were good? Or when times were difficult. Most of the great revivals took place in the most difficult times. When believers were losing everything and they didn't have anybody else but God, and they found out that God was sufficient. So, first thing, a person reminds us that the Lord relates to us personally, He relates to our feelings. Notice what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says But we have not an high priest which cannot be touched. With a, with a feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us, like as we are, yet without sin. We have not a high priest we cannot, which cannot be touched by our, our, uh, with the feelings of our infirmities. No, no, we have one that is actually touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And many in the Old Testament knew this, we have in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. You have several passages like that in the Old Testament, but you see this also in the New Testament. The same type of assurance in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. It says, but, uh, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Folks, let's get this straight. God relates to your feelings and my feelings. When you're sitting in, the, in your bedroom in a little corner, maybe nobody else seems to care, and you just, you're just you falling apart, that's the moment you need to remember that God relates, relates to how you feel. And He wants you to go beyond that. He wants you to understand that he also relates to your needs. What do you, but this is when you need to ask a question. The question, what, do we, what does Christ understand that I need so that maybe I can adjust to it? How many of you don't want to be happy? How many of you don't want to be financially stable? How many of you don't want to be health-wise stable also? I mean, we want all these things to happen. But what happens when, everything, when the bottom falls out and everything seems to be failing and we have this feeling this sensation that you know we, we can't we can't don't seem to have anybody around that i can lay my 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 burden on well, let me tell you that there is one and jesus is the one that we need to lay those burdens we need to understand that he relates to our feelings and he also relates to our needs philippians chapter 1 verse 29 says for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. What a privilege. Amen? To suffer for his sake? Wow, that was a big amen. <laughs> Do you believe this? You read this and you, you can't be kidding. It, read a little bit. For unto you it is given, it, it, I'm going to give you a blessing. In behalf of Christ. You want a blessing from Christ? Let me see your hand. Only one, no wonder it's always Carol who gives the blessings. So she shares her testimony. Oh, and Diana, of course, they're the one that always shares that. You know, you say, this is hard to swallow. It's for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know what Paul would have said to this? Bring it on. And he could say that with that confidence is because he understood. He knew who Christ was. And wanted to have a better understanding. In Hebrews chapter 11, we, under, we see that Joseph also understood this very as well. In Hebrews 11, 24, 26, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the uh, recompense of the reward. You know, you, you'll probably need two, three hours to chew on this and swallow it. You know, when you read this, it's just black and white. There's no problem to read it. But boy, and then you try to comprehend it, and it, and it challenges everything that you've ever learned. There's simply, how many times you've heard me say, it doesn't make sense. If you look at this from, you know, from a secular, from the, you know, from the, the from the, from the way the people outside the church would look at this, they would say, you guys, are nuts! You're crazy, crazy! You, you really lost it. Peter says, "You are a peculiar people." Some of you are very peculiar, by the way. Did you notice? Did you check yourself this morning in the mirror as soon as you walked, got up from bed? That was a joke. Come on. <laughs> <clears throat> so, folks, let me go to the second point. The first one again: how to. How we gain the proper perspective on adversity? Well, adversity 
reminds us. It's a reminder. It's a, hey, remember this. Remember this. You're forgetting it. You're, 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 you're absent. You're, you're just simply missing this point. Reminds us that the Lord relates to us personally. Can you say that this afternoon? The Lord relates to me personally. He relates to my feelings and He relates to my needs. Not Tim's needs, not to Kathy's needs. Not, no, He relates to my needs and believe it. He cares. He cares how I feel. And He cares of what I really need. But maybe what I really need is not what He thinks. I need. This is where we, where we're set off a little bit because sometimes we just want everything to go well. But when everything goes well, what happens? We tend to forget God. We forget to have those times, of quiet times with Him. We even neglect prayer, don't we? When things are going well, well, you know, I don't, I can do without God. Blessings are still going to come. And the Lord says, well, you know, I need to bring some affliction so that you will remember who I am or who I'm supposed to be in your life. Not only that, but that verse reminds us that the Lord has a purpose in mind. In John chapter 11, notice verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not up to death. But notice now, it says, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So, go back to the story. Here's this servant sent by Mary and Martha. Probably has to, has to do two days of walking. Finally arrives, they, he finds Jesus and his disciples, and with urgency in his voice, he says, Jesus, Jesus, you know, if you don't, I mean, it's already taken me so long to get here. If you don't rush back right now, if you don't drop everything you're doing, Martha and Mary, especially Lazarus, is going to be in real deep trouble. And Jesus said, uh, okay guys, what's the plan for today? Well, Jesus, but maybe we need to get, uh, do uh, you know, uh, our bags and get going. No, 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 we're, that, that can wait. I have a plan there. But Lord, if you don't do something now, he's going to die. But I need you to understand that I'm, I'm beyond death. I can do something about that. I'm beyond that. I mean, you need to understand that, you need to understand who I am. And so we need here to understand that his first purpose is to glorify himself. Verse uh, chapter 13, John chapter 30, uh, 13, verses 31 and 32 says, Therefore when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightaway and straight away glorify him. Glorify, glorify, glorify. It, it's all over the place here. John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou had given me to do. I'm finished the work. My job here says was to glorify the Father and to do that I had to go to the cross. What a blessing. A blessing to you. A blessing to me. But was it a blessing to Jesus Christ? It was, remember, I think we see it in Hebrews where Jesus is just hanging on the cross and he sees, he, he sees the future and he says that uh, he, he had great joy for what he could see his sacrifice do in the many lives of those who would come later on. On the cross, Jesus felt joy. But not because, you know, those nails were tickling his hands and his feet not because his, head, his back was not hurting, it's because he could see the outcome. So this is the point. When trials come, you need not to focus on the problem, but on the outcome. And when you understand that, you know what's going to happen with the trial? You're going to have, look at it in a different way. You're going to say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on, but I thank you because I trust you. Because I know you love me. You can relate to this situation. This is not past your control. This is under control. And so his purpose is, is to glorify himself. Second thing is, second purpose is to bring others to himself. The way you respond, folks, listen, the way you respond to a trial will bring people to Christ or will, or will push the people away from Christ. If you allow me, Samson, 
I'd like to share the experience you had a few days ago with your wife. They're new parents. You know what happens when you're new parents? You just heard that your wife is pregnant and you think everything's going to be wonderful and maybe a few weeks later you find that your wife is not feeling well, especially in the morning. She's not responding well to this pregnancy and then all kinds of things happen. You need to take the, you know, the wife to the emergency ward because, uh, you, you know, you find that maybe you're going to lose the baby. This is an experience that Samson and his wife went through the other day. And what are you, what are you doing? You're crying, right, Samson? You're crying, Lord, please don't take my baby away. Please, Lord, keep my wife safe. Lord, I was so happy a few days ago, and now I can almost touch death. And you, you feel like you're falling apart. And you kind of look around, Lord, I don't have anybody else to, I can, the doctors don't have any control of this. They can't really do anything about the problem. They can try to console you, but can they really do something? And all you can do is say, Lord, help me understand who you are. And at this point, the purpose sometimes, I'm not saying this is the, the case, but Sometimes it's to bring others to himself. Let me give you another story that you might be getting tired of me bringing my sister's name up. But she has so much, she, she does voluntary work in so many different places. The one that touches my heart most is this hospital she goes to where there's kids, small little kids, with, who are, who, who've been diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer. My sister knows that the kids she goes to and entertain for a few minutes might not be there in two, three weeks. And she tries to bring joy to their life. And she says, my heart breaks when I see their mothers just around the corner crying their eyes out, knowing that their son, beautiful son, a little daughter, a little baby, uh, you know, who's done nothing wrong, will be taken away. And I tell her, I said, honey, how, how can you handle that? That would break me in pieces. And she always gives me the same answer. Sammy, it's Jesus. He's beyond that. And if I go there, it's not because I can do anything. I can't do something about it. It's because I want to present them the solution. Hopefully, maybe some mother will listen. Maybe some child will get to understand. Maybe I can, you know, share with them something it would take their mind away from their problem and have them center their attention on something that's bring a smile to their face. I don't know, maybe she has a gift of compassion. I, I, I don't think I have the gift of compassion. Those who have the gift of compassion go into a hospital and people revive as soon as you walk in a room. If I walk in a room, they both people die. <laughs> I just don't have it. I just don't know what to say. I, I don't know. I, I push my wife in first and then I'll just keep quiet. Let her do all the job. So I need to learn something about this. You know, when you see people going through trouble, again, the second purpose is to bring others to Christ. Make sure that you are a magnet that will bring people and say, well, the reason why I can stay whole in this chaotic situation is because Christ is the center. He is the he is life. The word, Lazarus and Mary, I'm sorry, Mary and, and Martha were expecting a miracle. And Jesus comes like four days later and says, Lord, you're late. Did you, did you know that Jesus was never early or never late in any situation? God is never late or early. He's always on time. What we might think is late is perfect timing for the Lord. What we think is early uh, is not perfect timing. The Lord just knows when, and we need to trust Him with time. We need to trust Him with our situations. We must trust Him even with how we feel, not letting feelings take over. By giving Him the situation, don't focus on the problem, but focus on Him. Every time I remember this, I've been able to give myself up and say, Lord, 
I still don't understand what's going on, but I thank you because I know you are in perfect control. Hard for me to understand that you love me so much that when you would give your life for me, but Lord, I'm going to stand on that, on that truth. And what happens is, instead of feeling like running away, I feel like staying calm and sober. And when people see this in there, they say, how can, you, how can you be so calm in a situation like this? And I try to be honest about it. It's not because of who I am, it's because of who he is in me. <clears throat> and C, the third purpose in it is to give believers focus on himself in Jesus. Suffering may be one of God's most useful tools in developing believers into mature Christians. Did you know that? When things have gone well, people just simply get, become relaxed and they tend to slip away. But when things get difficult, do you remember when we first heard about COVID and then everything was, seemed like the world was going to, the end, to an end? And then they said that we couldn't meet any longer. And all of these different chains that we went through, I thought, what are we going to do now? How many of you uh, inside going to put yourself together and say, Lord, I know this is going to end. I, th I know this is going to result for the good. It didn't seem so for almost three years. But you know, I grew through those three years more than many other years where we didn't have COVID. Because it made me come to the Lord again and again for His enabling. Having to trust Him in every different situations where I was not ready for it. And it also did the same thing with the church. You know what happened the first six months when we had COVID? People were saying, Pastor, since we cannot meet, maybe we can have not one prayer meeting a week, but two. I said, okay. So we're going to be dealing with this computer twice a week with every, all the problems that that brings. And we did that for some time. I thought, you know, they want more. They want, remember that time? It was like, we want, we understand that Jesus is really the key. And I was thrilled. But then things started getting more relaxed and we saw people getting in front of the screen in their pajamas with a very relaxed, like, Go home. All right. This is it. And I thought, oh Lord, we're losing it again. Maybe we need a COVID that lasts 20 years. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm only kidding. We don't want that. But you know, it seems like adversity catches our attention. It gets our attention off self and on the Lord because nothing else demonstrates how utterly hopeless we really are. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, it says, for our, for our light affliction, let's, uh, pay attention to these, how Paul expresses himself. For our light, remember that word, light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Did you ever, when, when Paul says this light of affliction, you know what he's referring to? Come with me real fast to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Hold your place there in John chapter 10, yeah, sorry, 11. And come with me real fast to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm almost finished. Okay, Paul, tell us, explain to us what that light affliction looks like. Look with me at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? As big as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prison, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In, in journeys, often, in perils of water, in perils of robber, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, 
in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Light affliction? Are you kidding me? Any of these things would have broken us. You know, we are, every, you know, I, 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 do you keep up with the news? With what's happening in the world? <clears throat> the world is falling apart. <laughs> and when I look at my the, the, the living room window, I see the beautiful Mediterranean, beautiful sun, and I walk out to the balcony and I see that and everything is glowing. And I said, Lord, we live in a bubble. We, we, don't, we don't experience any of that. You, know, you think, we all want this kind of thing. We all want to enjoy what we enjoy here in the Costa del Sol. But what would happen if any of these things would come into our life? Would we look at the situation with the same joy, with the same gladness? Would we consider that God is still good? Would we understand that God still cares, that He still relates with us? Would we understand that He has a purpose for that light affliction to come into our life? Would we understand who He is? Or would we just fall into, you know, uh, break in pieces and start crying? Folks, what I want to live, live with you this afternoon is that we need to gain the proper perspective on adversity. Adversity reminds us that the Lord relates to you personally. Write that down. Put it in your Bible and you feel like this is not true. Go to John chapter 11 and see that he does relate to us personally. He relates to our feelings. He relates to our needs. And adversity reminds us that the Lord has a purpose in mind. What are those purposes? Three. He first, his first purpose is to glorify Himself. What, how am I going to respond that's going to, be, going to bring glory to the Lord? How is my faith going to show in a situation like this? What are others going to see in me? Will they see that I truly trust the Lord, whatever the situation might be? His second purpose is to bring others to himself. How is my testimony going to affect my kids, my family, my friends, my neighbors, other people in the church? I will either communicate lack of faith in Christ or abundant faith in Christ. And his third purpose is to get believers focused on himself. We are so self-centered, aren't we? When I read a message like this, I make me feel like getting on my knees and saying, Lord, please help me get, get my eyes off myself. Lord, help me get my eyes off the circumstance of the situation and help me put my eyes on you. Help me get a proper perspective of who you are proper understanding. May I feel, may I understand that whatever comes my way, it's under control. You haven't lost control. You have perfect control. And if you allow this into my life, it's because you have a purpose. You want to perfect me. And through me, you want to bring others to Christ. How I respond, my testimony, will bring people away from Christ, I will bring people to Christ. That's all. I'm going to stand and uh, have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, you tell us there in the James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, to count it all joy, all joy, when we fall into diverse temptations or trials. And the only way we can actually enjoy, that we can actually and have this joy is knowing that the trying of our faith workers 
patience, which is another way of saying endurance. But you tell us, Lord, there in verse 4, to let patience have its full, uh, have its proper, uh, its perfect work, that we may be perfect and entire one to nothing. Father, we read this, I've read this now for the last 43 years that I've been saved so many times. But every time I come to it, I find that I, there's something, I see it in a, in a very fresh way, with a much more mature um, mind. And I find that there, there can, there can, that there can be a tremendous joy, full joy, all joy, as you say, when we go through trials. Because you're there, and you care, and you want to do something wonderful to us. You want to make, you want to produce endurance in us. Want to produce something in us that will make us strong, full, complete, more like Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that when trials do knock in our door, we will not run away from them, scared, crying, but we will face them uh, in a very bold way, understanding that you're there with us. We can handle anything when you're there, but without you, Lord, we can do nothing. So Lord, I pray that you continue working in our lives. Produce the purpose in us that you want. May we be Christ-centered and not self-centered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.